This is the SFF Audio Podcast. Escape Pod has uh, one of the stories from John Joseph Adams' uh, Seeds of Change anthology. Ooh. That might be good. Uh, Tobias you know, John story. Joseph Adams, his, those are really neat anthologies. Yeah. I, um, I can't wait to get my hands on um, The Living Dead, which is his latest. Mm-hmm. Um, great big anthology full of zombie stories. I can't wait I've to got, get its hands I've got on you. Wastelands. Wastelands is wonderful. Absolutely terrific. Should be on audio. Yeah. I've been wondering what... Uh, it, it sounds like, you know, he'd like to do that, and it just... It's not... Um... Mm-hmm. Well, anthologies are tough, and I know that from having tried to put one together for um, one of the companies. It's, it's hard because, um, you know, you've got to contract with every single author Mm -hmm. so it's difficult it's much easier to do um single author collections than it is to do a more people to pay with an anthology yeah and more people to come to terms with Mm -hmm. and um uh, way more to keep track of when the money does start to come in so actually we've got two from seeds of change here and there's another one uh from a couple weeks ago uh by jeremy tolbert arties aren't stupid and Resistance by Tobias Buckel. So it might be coming a virtual anthology. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I've got some new releases here, or uh, new arrivals, that is, things that have come in. What's come in? It is is Epic Fantasy Week here at SFF Audio. Cool. Mm Mm-hmm. First one in from Brilliance, Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. That's the first volume in, um, I wonder what they call the series. It doesn't say what the series is called on here, Um, and I do not recall what it's called, but the reason that they re-released this first one is because there's going to be a television series, and um, it's going to be called... It's going to be called Legend of the Seeker. So the cover is, um, it says Wizard's First Rule, the basis for the new television series Legend of the Seeker. So it's got a new cover and everything. Is this going to be an animated feature or a It doesn't look like it. It looks looks like it is live action. That's interesting. So, yeah. So it's re-released. I guess Um, it's... Very, uh, very popular. I'm afraid I haven't heard it. Or I haven't read it even, um, so I can't really comment too much about it. But I know that it's insanely popular. The first uh, several novels of that series. I don't know how many he's up to now, but but I believe it, that really predates it. Um, Harry Potter, doesn't it? Oh yeah, by a long way, by a long way. Uh, from 1994. Mm-hmm. Just looking at it here. Hmm. Oh, that's not... Maybe that doesn't predate. When when did Harry Potter come out? It's just, um, looks like, you know, a TV show. That's that's a lot of... a lot of attention. Yeah, did you know that they're doing, um, George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire as a television show? Yeah, I heard you, you were saying that, and I, have, I haven't seen it show up on the schedule yet. Yeah, it's it's still out there. It's going to be on HBO, and they're taking... That's the way to do it. ...novel... The first novel called A Game of Thrones is going to be the first season. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's the the way I have high doing. hopes. I have high hopes. It should be fun. I, the I way they're do doing it. True Blood as well is my understanding. That True Blood is based on the Charlene Harris series of um, Southern vampire mysteries. Yeah, yeah, and that may have started. Yeah, it has started, mm-hmm. and it's getting pretty positive okay. reviews. Uh, Harry Potter, number one, June 26th, 97. Okay. Uh, but, um, <laughs> paperback for Wizard's First Rule, Jul- mm-hmm. July 15th, 97. Oh, wow. So, right, right in the I, time. you know, I didn't notice Harry Potter until probably the third volume. I think that's when it went nuts. 
Yeah, so, when when it it overflowed into uh, insanity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think most people didn't notice until we were uh, uh, edging in on the millennium. <laughs> All right. Another one. Um, this is an author that I've seen so much, but I have never read anything by, and she writes fantasy. Mercedes Lackey. Mm-hmm. It's a book called Foundation, if you can believe it or not. I believe it. I wonder uh, if they knew that that was a famous title. Um, it's read by... Oh, I didn't even mention that. Um, oh, and I can't even pronounce this fellow's name. But he is a wonderful narrator. Spell it. Sam, Sam Tsouvas. <laughs> T-S-O-U-T-S-O-U-V-A-S. He reads Wizard's First Rule. Suvius or something like that. Suvius, yeah, it sounds right. Or I should have looked S- up how to pronounce Greek. that before getting online. Yeah, it looks Greek to me. T S. Um, so that's the narrator of Wizard's First Rule. Um, what the narrator? Is brilliance of, as well. Yes. Uh huh. Foundation is brilliance as well, mm-hmm. and it's read by Nick Podell, someone who I have not heard. Um. So it's a fantasy adventure. This one's not so fat, though. It's uh, ten hours long. Um, Wizard's first rule, of course, is something like 30 CDs. Oh, my God. <laughs> yep, 28 CDs, 35 hours. Wow. That's that's yep. quite a commitment, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I mean, we talked about Anathem a while back. Still haven't got that in, by the way. Um, it hasn't arrived yet? Uh, it has not arrived yet. I don't know if it's on its way or I've been what. reading uh, people's reviews around the net. Mm-hmm. They say it's definitely a Stephen uh, Neil Stephenson book. Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, awesome. Yeah, I think that that's. Um, uh, but also, um, uh, you have to like Neil Stephenson to uh, to like this book. Yeah. Yep. Okay, the other fat fantasy that came in, twenty four CDs, twenty seven and a half hours is. Uh, Elantris by Brandon Sanderson. Oh yes, we talked we talked about this last week. Mm-hmm. Um, narrated by Jack Garrett, and this is from Recorded Books, and it's another one in their sci-fi imprint. Um, so they've been doing really well with that. Yeah, you made me uh, interested in that one. That one sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. Okay, and we talked about that last week, so I won't do it again. Um, and then I got two titles. From that L. Ron Hubbard series. Oh, two more. Two more, yep. One of them's called Danger in the Dark, and the other one is called The Iron Duke. And I know each one has uh, more than one story in it, and they're multi... Well, you you listen to one. I've actually got one. Uh, the second review's done. <coughs> I'll post that. Oh, do you? Soon. Yeah. Well, what did you think? How, how was the reading done? Um, the performances are very good. Uh, but they're completely unnecessary. Um, it seems like a make-work project because multi-narrators are not what are needed for the most part. There's not a lot of dialogue, mm. um, and there's also you know sound effects and music. Uh, it's mm-hmm. it's not it's it's like um, you know polishing up a, a a pretty rock. It's not it's not a um, it's not a necessary thing. The, the, some of the stories are actually pretty, pretty good and pretty pulpy, but the, um, but the, making it a full cast production with sound effects and narrators and all that stuff, it, it, it just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like that anyways. Um, right. Uh, multiple readers can be okay, especially when full cast audio does it, but. Um, it, it's completely unnecessary in this case because most of the stories maybe have two speaking roles at most. Some of them don't even have more than one. Mm-hmm. Um, so when a guy finally says something, it's got a different guy saying it. It's like, well, who is the rest of this cast? We know who who the major player in each of the stories is, but we don't know who, you know, who the actors are. We I have a list, but I, I I'm not sure who's reading what. Mm-hmm. It doesn't it doesn't really say. Right. Okay. So um Well, we're gonna be getting a lot of these I believe. So <laughs> Well uh-huh. um I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break on it because uh uh-huh. Well I may give one a shot. Yeah, go um, for it. There's one called the Iron Duke. 
I think that they may say uh, they may be doing some other genre stuff. So the one I got was uh, one collection was fantasy, one was uh, science fiction, mm-hmm. and um, they're definitely like they feel like very pulp era stories, and uh, that's sort of good and sort of bad. It's good in the way pulp stories are good, and it's bad in the way pulp stories are bad. Mm-hmm. They feel very quickly written. They feel written for for a market to sell rather than for you know to fit uh, a particular idea that somebody's working out but on the other hand some of the stuff is it's very iconic and in that way it makes it sort of interesting mm. you know, to feel like the original how it was originally done but I, I right. if they release 140 of these it's going to be uh, well more than my taste will will allow for I see. All right. Okay, I've got uh, some Blackstone audio titles as well. Good. Big, big week. All right. The Halloween Tree by Ray Bradbury. Hmm. Um, this is a an audio drama, two CDs long from the Jerry Robbins and the Colonial Radio Players. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember Kurt uh, posted a review of uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Mm-hmm. Um, done by the same people, and uh, it was very positive. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm gonna try to get it uh, posted this week. Oh, Halloween great. week! Yeah. Yeah, it's Halloween's coming right up, isn't it? It sure is. It's uh, Friday. Orson uh, Scott Card. What are your little going? ghouls and ghosts going as? Um, Alex is going as a ghost. <laughs> Good. Uh, my daughter, my daughter's going as a ghost, and Chris, I don't think is going as anything. He's in high school now. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's in ninth grade. Yeah, that's probably a little too late. Yep, yep. Um, what kind of ghost, though? It's very important. I haven't... I have not seen it. Okay. Uh, let me put it... Put this out there. Try try Korean ghosts. There's like five or six different kinds, and they're all very strange. Huh. Uh, look it up on uh, Wikipedia or all something. All right, we'll do. It, I will do. Different kind I know of ghost. they've... Put something together. I'll see what kind it is. Cool. Mm-hmm. Send pictures. <laughs> we'll do. All right. We'll do. All right. Um, the Ships of Earth, uh, Volume Three of the Homecoming series by Orson Scott Card, read by Stefan Rudnicki. Um, got Volume Two not too long ago. That's that uh, series we talked about on here. That's based on the the Book of Mormon. But, yep. Okay. That's it. And Philip K. Dick. More, more. Yeah, Valis. Okay. You familiar with that novel? I have not read it. It's um, one of his his late seventies novels. Um, mm-hmm. uh, more of his spiritual uh, science fiction. Well, good. I've heard about it. I've heard quite a lot about it. Okay. Read by Tom Weiner. Great. Weiner? Yeah, he's good. Okay. So that's the titles from Blackstone. Now, yesterday, while driving back from that play, I finished the Graveyard Book. Oh, really? Neil Gaiman. Yeah, absolutely terrific. Yeah. Um, I'll try and get something written up, but uh, it's were you great sharing fun. a car with a bunch of people? I was, but um, I was on my own iPod. I really wanted to finish it. <laughs> I was uh I had one chapter left to go. So uh, You going to write up a review? Oh yeah, sure. You bet. And how was it? Uh, it was terrific. It was terrific. It's a YA book, mm-hmm. so perfectly um ad- or uh appropriate, perfectly appropriate for your kids. Um it is a uh, there is a little bit of scary stuff in it, but it's not like Coraline. Coraline was downright disturbing. But Coraline kind of has a, you know, when kids read it, they think it's really cool. And when adults read it, they find it disturbing. So that's Coraline. Coraline kids is can terrific. take it. Their yeah. imaginations are not as uh, dangerous. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. Um, the Graveyard Book is really, um, you know, I heard it described, and I think I described it on the show, um, as a um, jungle book but with ghosts. So um, what happens in the very first chapter, 
uh, there's a toddler whose family is killed by a bad guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the toddler happens to go outside while all this is happening and uh, trundles up the road and into a graveyard um, while his family's being murdered. And ghosts in the graveyard decide to take care of the kid because they know he's alone. And um, Sounds great. Yeah, it's it's really terrific. It's great fun. It's great fun. I mean, it's got all of the... It's everything you'd expect, you know, Neil Gaiman. So, it, you know, none of it was unexpected, but it was fun. It was just completely entertaining the entire way. And uh, my daughter Alex listened to that, too. She loved it. Right. And uh, speaking of listening, Chris, my son, has... Gosh, he's probably blown through the first third of Elantris already. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, he's uh, been listening to it nonstop. Are we going to get a review? Yeah, well, I, yeah, we can get a review from him. Do sure. it, do it, do it. <laughs> LibriVox, we talk about them quite a bit. I know, like they have got another me. really nice uh, collection of short fiction. Yeah, um... And this is by... Oh, they're all by the same fellow. Yeah, it's all Alan, Alan E. Nurse. Nurse. Mm -hmm. Some of it's been An released. author I am unfamiliar with. Well, you know, um, that's kind of a shame. Is it? Yeah. It's Where not. should I start? Um, well, the probably the best bet is on our page for um, mm -hmm. Alan E. Norse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there's an Alan E. Norse page, and on it there is um, one that was released... Um, by Liverbox, but also on Podio Books uh, by Scott Farquhar. He's one of the guys on the um, Prometheus Radio Theater, and mm. he's got he's got a very good performing performing voice. He's um, you know amateur actor, um, and this is a really good novel. It's uh, Alan Nurse is a doctor, um, and he actually earned his. Um, his tuition by selling science fiction stories, mm -hmm. um, and then after after he became a doctor, he still kept writing, and he wrote uh, many books on um, actually uh, uh, sexual transmitted disease uh, education quite a bit. But um, he also wrote a lot of science fiction, all wrapped up in medical uh, plots. Um, and mm -hmm. the one that is listed here that I, I think if you start off with you'll really like is called Star Surgeon. It's a um, it's it's kind of like a Heinlein juvenile. It's it's a uh, it's imagine Heinlein writing a novel about young doctors, um, and they all get together on a uh, on Earth to go to school, and then they um, go off on their senior year is a um, it's like uh, Doctors Without um, Borders, except in outer space. They go from uh -huh. planet to planet um, treating um, uh, diseases. And it's, it's an adventure story. It's a, in the tradition of a Heinlein juvenile, but it's also, you know, the growing up, uh, breaking out from racism and that sort of thing. The main character is actually an alien, and most everybody else is just a human being. So huh. it's it's very good, very very enjoyable, and I promise you, if you listen to it, you'll like it. Great, that's Great. a promise. It is on the list. We'll get her downloaded. This new uh, short story collection. I, I listened to um, samples from all of the the uh, readings, and none of them is actually spectacular. Um, they've all sort of got the standard, you know, one problem here, one problem there. Um, one of the guys has a uh, it sounds like an Italian accent, um, really strong Italian accent, and that makes it difficult for people who are actually are um, having a little trouble uh, with English themselves. Um, mm -hmm. If you're um, if you're learning English, uh, it's hard to hear other accents. But I I I could understand everything he was saying, so um, I think it'll work. It just won't work for everybody. Um, and then other ones, you know, they're too quiet, or they're, they're, they've got, they've put in some filter that makes the, makes the sound wrong. Some people have cheap microphones. Uh, all sorts of little issues. 
And this is what happens when, um, I, like I've been reading a lot about how people, they, they don't like LibriVox because they, they don't set the bar high enough. Mm-hmm. Well, that's because there is no bar, right? There's Anybody yeah. can do it. Um, but I, the way I look at it, it doesn't ruin the audiobook to have uh, multiple versions out there. You know, and, and they'll just keep releasing it until there's a really awesome version, and then you can stop worrying about it. But so I did a little mini review, just saying who, which ones are uh, listenable and which ones are um, better than others. Huh. All right. Yeah, I noticed on Escape Pod you were mentioning um, some of the stories from John Joseph Adams' Seeds of Change. Mm-hmm. Um, Tobias Bakel, yeah, Tobias Bakel is one of the Metropolis writers, mm-hmm. and um, that came out this week. We talked about that last week. Yeah, I started listening so. to the uh, first book, or the first okay. first part. You're right; it's super info dumpy, um, but it's still good. It's a little, it's a little um, hard to follow, and I actually think that um, what John Joseph Adams said in his review about it was um, that it. It would it might be one of these cases where uh, this is actually one that's better suited for paper. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in the way that this one's told, this first this first story, it's not particularly well suited for audio. That isn't to say it it doesn't work. It just um, it's it's not like you know. There's some some styles of telling a story are very suited for audio, mm-hmm. especially first yeah. person and. Um, that sort of thing, but this is not. Um, but on the other hand, that's uh, doesn't bother me too much. I I, I can yeah. What what I got <clears throat> what I got from uh, John Joseph Adams's review the which appeared on tour mm-hmm. by the way yeah um, was that he was just a little bit surprised being in an audio only anthology. He was a little bit surprised that they didn't take advantage of the medium. Yeah. Um, he, he wasn't calling for it to be an audio drama or anything like that. No, no, there, that's not what I was There are saying. certain things that you can do to make it better on audio. Mm-hmm. Um, and Yeah, yeah. Um, in the interview between Scalzi and uh, Bacal, uh, Scalzi said, you know, what? did you do anything to... Uh, to um, take advantage of the fact that this was going to be on audio, and, and Buckel said no, um, and I think you know that kind of shows up. And right. the, uh, uh, the fact that you know s- sometimes it's just not um, the best way to tell a story, and it's not because the story is is um, bad. It's just not there. There are better mediums for different kinds of storytelling. Right, and I, I agree with that. Um, but you know Jay Lake's story, um, like I said in the review, he does a lot of the heavy lifting, the the world building. Yeah. And then um, you know the other stories, they, they all deal with stuff as well. It's not like they're all devoid of that. But um, Jay Lake was called on to do a lot of that. So the the other stories, I guess I'm saying, are not as info dumpy. Mm-hmm. But as we're sitting here talking. You know, John Scalzi's writing style is perfect for audio. I um, I think his um, Old Man's War certainly was. Um, mm-hmm. There's one that I heard that was not, but that it was because it was not told uh, in the right way. You know, it's not <laughs> not first person. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, yeah, but yeah, Old Man's War. I have not heard that on audio, but I read oh, it's it in print. Terrific. I read it in print, and I could tell while reading it that, hey, this would be a fantastic audiobook. And it's the same with the story um, that he wrote for Metatropolis as well. So there's something about his writing style. Like, Orson Scott Card is wonderful on audio. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, those who aren't. Um, one of my one of the authors on my wish list is Gene Wolfe, and I know that some of his stuff would be difficult on audio. Mm. A lot of his stuff would be fantastic, but uh, some of the more difficult stuff probably wouldn't be good on audio. Right. Yeah. A um, couple other things that happen this. So week. wait, wait. What are we saying then about audio? Are we saying? <laughs> yeah. Are we saying that um, 
they have to be more simple or it complex equals no good on audio? Um, I don't think that it's no good. I think that I, I can see the point that he's making. Um, I don't think uh-huh. you made that point in your review. Um, no, I, I didn't because I'm used to... Well, yeah, I mean, I, John Joseph uh, Adams listens to a lot of audiobooks too, but I'm, I'm just saying that didn't stand out to me as, hey, this is just no good on audio. I mean, I was listening to it, and what happens with a lot of books is I lose, I lose it, and sometimes I have to back up mm-hmm. because my mind starts wandering. Sure. Those are the hardest ones to listen to, and um, Jay Lake's story was like that for me. Yeah, and that's um, what that's what I'm uh, thinking as well. And I, I mm-hmm. guess you did address it, but you didn't address it as a. Um, as a uh, audio issue, you just addressed it as a story issue, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I, th- I think that um, he's right in that. In this case, um, seeing 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 it in a print um, with you know set off, which you can't do in um, in uh, audio. You can't set off. You could use a different uh, narrator to do um, to do different kinds of writing and that's that's been done but mm-hmm. that wasn't done in this case so all of a sudden you know we're, we're listening to the action and then we get a, a little mini lecture on the history of some uh, neighborhood or whatever and then go back to the story and with the same narrator and no no uh, um, audio italics it, it becomes a little bit con- jarring the confusion between the, mm. the two Yeah. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right. Yep. I was just curious. The uh, I'm here on Tor.com, and I was looking at his review again, and um, there's an ad for the Anathem audiobook on there. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, it's the Manor ad. Not hey. the book, but the audiobook. Mm-hmm. Going to go look. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the Looks top? like every time every time I refresh, it changes. M- at yeah, the top it was, there? It was at the top, yep. Now I'm looking at a vampire novel. Yeah, me too. Refreshing. Now I'm looking at Discworld. Refreshing. Now I'm looking at Scientific American. <laughs> this is AdWatch podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh... I don't see it now. Anyway, it was there. Okay, I believe you, Scott. Don't. Maybe, maybe if I click into the review, since it said audiobook, maybe it came up. No. Virgil's The Aeneid came out. Um, this is a multi, uh, multi-reader multi version, and um, it's also a very old um, poetic translation. Now, have you read The Aeneid, or did you... Yes. Uh huh. Had a had a class on mythology in college, and that was one of the things we read. Yeah, it's a it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's like um, it's it's like the um, national epic of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. It was commissioned by um, Augustus for um, for basically the the uh, the enjoyment of. Augustus, um, and so there's a, a few tributes to uh, you know his wa- his wise rule, um, etc. But um, w- what I like about it is the ending. I think the ending is is awesome because it it sort of characterizes the the character of the Roman people. Mm-hmm. And um, when we were reading reading it in. Uh, uh, the university course I took it in, um, a humanities course on uh, Virgil. Uh, the instructor was, you know, saying, "Well, see how this this doesn't fit," and he died before finishing it. Therefore, um, we think that you know this scene was just cut off because he was still busy. He was going to write some more. And I was saying, "No, no, this is the this he intended to do it this way. Um, he might have been." You know, going to go fix something else, but he wouldn't fix this because this is the perfect ending. The guy who characterizes, um, you know, uh, reason and uh, 
piety and all the th all the good qualities right he's sort of like a um he's sort of like an odysseus without any uh of the craftiness he's he's just a straightforward you know hero hero figure with no um major um flaws which is uh, which is unlike the it's a very roman uh way of looking at it you know uh yeah sure odysseus is smart but he's he's too um He's too uh, uh, full of himself. He thinks he's so smart, and so the gods punish mm -hmm. him. And that's mm -hmm. not the true. That's not the case with the Romans, right? That's the way the Romans look at it. Is we're we're much more pious than the these uh, these um, Greeks. But at, right at the end, what happens? He he sub he submits to his own um, revenge, and mm -hmm. and becomes the opposite of what. He, you know the rest of the book is about and and that's what gives the books so much power at the end it you know um he he could be merciful and and um that would fit into our tradition of um you know uh the hero always does what's good and never does what's bad uh, right. and yet he doesn't so one of the things like i i have a i really I like Batman. I think Batman's a really good superhero. When I was a kid, I thought Batman was the superhero I'd want to be because mm -hmm. Batman doesn't have superpowers, right? He's just a right. a guy who um has a strong desire and luckily uh, <laughs> the uh the uh fortune to make make it his full-time occupation secretly. Um unlike Superman who has, you know, endless endless powers that you know he, his problems are all um generated badly by uh exceptions to his rules right kryptonite <laughs> it's basically you know the second by the second superman story you basically have to introduce kryptonite otherwise there's no conflict for poor old superman well batman has it all built in mm -hmm. um, but one of the problems i have with batman is um and they say this over and over again. I just watched a new Batman uh, animated movie, and Batman doesn't kill, right? This is Batman's mm -hmm. um, this is Batman's rule, and to me, this <coughs> is completely hypocritical. Because if you're going around punching people, jumping off of buildings, and shooting them with grapple guns, you're going to kill people just by uh, accident. It's not going to happen uh, every time, but it will happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how many times has uh, Batman captured the Joker or the Penguin, right? He captures right. them, and then they go to Arkham Asylum for a while, and then they escape. Um, I'm not saying he should kill them, but killing them will happen eventually. Police don't always intend to kill uh, the people they subdue, you know, using a taser or whatever, but people do get killed by tasers, and ba Batman's using, you know... No matter how good his techniques for, you know, subduing his victims, or I guess his his uh, prey, mm -hmm. um, he's still going to end up killing some people or paralyzing them or something, right? Something that's permanent. And it's kind of a cheat to say that, well, Batman doesn't have to do that because he's got, you know, he's so specially trained. That's just bullshit. Mm -hmm. Right. When you're a kid, it it makes sense. But when you look at it a little closer, it's bullshit. And um, I think that it's also true of a hero in the real world. If you um, if you look at anybody up close, you're going to see that they're not perfect, and that if you live by the sword, you 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 may occasionally do uh, something wrong with that sword. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes I think the Indian so great is it shows uh, the reality of the situation. It, it's, you know, um, if you're, uh, you've had your, your country taken away from you, you're, you're a refugee and you're living in um, uh, someone else's land, trying to make peace and doing your best to make peace with the people there, but somebody doesn't like you, um, and they kill one of your friends, <laughs> and then it, the time comes to show mercy and you don't, I think that that's realistic, uh -huh. and I think that's what makes it great. It's, it's noir is real. The Aeneid has a, a, a noir ending. 
which I uh -huh. think is um, very interesting, given that it's uh, a lot of stories don't. A lot of oh. ancient stories don't. Mm -hmm. They have. There's uh, a Greek tradition with um, uh, sort of noir beginnings uh, or noir middles, uh, but they have this uh, strange tradition that also doesn't fit in with uh, our modern day things like. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, Oedipus Rex. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Why does why does oh, why do bad things happen to him? Because the gods fated it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not anything he did. He he in fact tries to avoid his own fate that the gods have have dealt him. He does his best to avoid his fate, but. Right. Um, his shame is public, and for the ancient Greeks, their problems are shown. Uh, their moral problems are shown on their bodies, right? Their moral failings ha are are visible. This is why he tears out his own eyes, not because um, not because what he did was his own fault, but because what he did was wrong. And um, so the, he's matching, he's matching his his uh, his internal uh, shame with uh, an external shame. It's 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 very doesn't fit in with our modern way of thinking, mm -hmm. right? You, you see that and you say that's an that's a weird story, right? But it, it doesn't say you know, or it says that's that's terrible. Uh, that doesn't mean anything to me because that would you know, if if I was in that situation. Um, I'd I'd feel bad, but I wouldn't tear my own eyes out. Right. <laughs> um, right. Um, whereas I think the Roman um, the Roman ethos is a little bit more advanced in in its uh, uh, system. I talked about how um, <clears throat> Nietzsche came up with this idea of uh, master and slave morality, and master morality is morality saying that anything that you that you think is good is good, and anything that is bad is what's against the good. It's very simple. But if if they have territory that you want, if somebody has the territory that they want, they feel no problem going in and taking taking it from those people. There's no moral crime there. Um, m the moral crimes only come from breaking um, breaking your word, breaking um, breaking your. Um, your uh, goals breaking with what you value mm -hmm. and whatever value whatever you value is and the idea is uh, Nietzsche was um, talking about how Christian uh, morality is based on the idea of a slave morality um, it, uh, overturning what is master morality the idea being if you're a slave um, what do you value? you value the things that your master doesn't because that's all that's left to you. you if you, if he, if he thinks um, violence is good, you think peace is good. If he thinks um, rape is good, you think rape is bad. If he thinks slavery is good, you think slavery is bad. So, what do you mean Christianity is based on that? Well, this is this is Nietzsche's idea of of um, the why Christian values are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, I mean, he t he's saying you know it's based on sure it's based on the the Bible, but the reason it works, the reason why it took hold in the mm -hmm. Roman Empire is because um, there was it was started off as a slave religion, a religion of slaves. And what do the slaves value? Well, they don't value the same things their masters value. Mm -hmm. They value what's left to them, right? What 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 they can value in opposition to being slaves. Okay, and so they value um, the things that uh, masters don't value. So meekness, for example, the meek shall inherit the earth. Is this uh, what the Romans would think? You know, the guys that go around conquering everybody? No, yeah. this is what the slaves would value because this is what they are. They're they're meek. It's you know, uh, hopefully if we you know keep our heads down and we're we're um, uh, you know sufficiently holy will we'll inherit the earth this is um, the idea of a slave morality it's an overturning of 
whatever the master morality is. And he, he basically says master morality is doing what you want. Um, and then, therefore, slave morality is one that will um, value the opposite of that, whatever that is. And so mm. uh, it fits this new Ro- the, this Roman epic fits into our understanding of of what what a story a good story makes why why noir works is because it's it's um it's telling a story that we can understand based on the judeo christian background that we all hold so uh, um they don't read they don't read uh roman uh, classics um, in Asia. This is not what they study in university, mm-hmm. right? Um, it just doesn't do it for them because they don't have the background for it. Long time ago, uh, I sent Rick a copy of this um, uh, audio drama. Actually, it's an unabridged unabridged full cast production of a novel called Sleeping Beauty Mm -hmm. and um, he just posted a review of it I guess um, uh, this I sent it to him back when uh, the original Oral Noir Noir website was up and um, he just posted a review of it it's excellent Um, I've heard it as well and it's a a novel by Ross McDonald who um, was a really awesome uh mystery author in the tradition of Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and um, this is a full cast production it was done originally for a radio station uh, in Los Angeles or outside Los Angeles uh, Santa Barbara I guess Um, and uh, there's a a review of it very um, very interesting but um, back at the time we um, we received these. They, I was told that there was going to be a CD version available. There's still not yet a CD version available. Um, it was a couple of years ago, at least, we received this. Um, but there's there is a, another book which um, I don't know if uh, Rick knew that, but um, there's another book starring the same people uh, called mm. the Zebra Striped Hearse, and I'll, we'll see if we can't get a review of that up um, before. Uh, before a couple more years go by. Um, this is a full cast reading in the tradition of full cast audio. Uh, okay. But unabridged of a book. It's pretty amazing. Oh, and there are sound effects, though. That's that's the one thing. So it sort of fits in with all the things I say I don't like, but um, uh-huh. it's, it, it's, it's an audio drama, basically. Um, but mm-hmm. the entire book. So all the attributives are taken away, just like in uh, full cast. Um, but we don't, you know, hear a sound effect and then uh, are told about it, or told about it and then hear hear about it. They, whoever adapted them, and it doesn't really say, whoever adapted them did an amazing job. This has been the SFF Audio Podcast. Please join us at www.sffaudio.com.